This means even though height changed by one foot, heritability remains 80%. It tells us nothing about the manifestation of the actual trait we're interested in. So if you think heritability means we're all stuck in a certain box, nope, we can outgrow, outshine, outbuild any genes our parents gave us, but so long as we're collectively doing it as a group or a society, that will never show up in the heritability measure. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now as you know, we're taking a look at this nature versus nurture debate. And in the first video we saw that genes don't work the way most people think they do. And in the second video we saw how this impacts student learning at the individual level. Now in this video I want to take a look at the question of heritability. So as you know, any trait has a lot of variability within any particular group. So for instance, take height. If we had a group of people, some of them would be tall, some would be short, we'd have a lot of variability. Now heritability is a statistic that tries to say how much of this group variability is due to genes, to genetic factors. And the way heritability is sussed out is by comparing identical twins to non-identical twins. So as you may know, identical twins are believed to share all the same genes, while non-identical or fraternal twins are only believed to share 50% of their genes. So the idea is shockingly simple. If we compare these two groups, any traits that identical twins share more frequently than non-identical twins must be due to their shared genes. Ergo, it must be genetic. So just as a simple example, imagine we had 10 pairs of identical twins that all had the exact same height and 10 pairs of non-identical twins where only one pair had the same height, we could say, look, height is genetic. It's 90% heritable. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I hate heritability. I think this is one of the stupidest measures in all of science, but for some reason, it just refuses to die. It doesn't matter how many times we rail against it and say this is nonsense, it just keeps hanging around. I kind of think of it like that invincible black knight in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. None shall pass. So together, let's treat heritability like the black knight and let's lop off some of its limbs. So let's start here. Limb number one, heritability is an out dated measurement. So comparing twins to estimate genetic influence was really important in the early and mid 1900s because we didn't have access to genes. We didn't have the right tools to directly measure the genes. So we were stuck with simply estimating what they might have been. But now that we have the tools to look at the actual genes we're talking about, of what use is it to continue to estimate, to take a guess at what they might say? look at the actual genes themselves. The way I think about this is neuroscience. We used to use phrenology. We would measure the skull to try and guess at what the brain characteristics were underneath. But once we developed brain imaging tools like EEG and MRI, everyone stopped doing phrenology. Why? Because what good is estimating when you now have access to the actual thing? So what happens when we do look at the genes and do look at this actual data? Well, let's take something like intelligence. According to twin research, intelligence is between 60 and 80% heritable. This means about 70% of the variability in intelligence is due to genes. But that's from twin data. When we look at the actual genes themselves and ask, okay, which genes are contributing? The last time we looked, we found over 1,000 genes contributing to intelligence. And combined, these 1,000 genes could only explain 5.2% of heritability. And this is true for everything we're looking at genetically. In fact, this is now so bad that there's a phrase called missing heritability. The difference between our estimate and reality is so wide that everyone's saying, where'd the heritability go? <laughs> Tis but a scratch. Now, the second problem with heritability is its core assumption. Heritability assumes that every trait we have can be divided into its genetic component and its environmental component. But think back to our first video and that water bucket metaphor. Nobody believes that genes and environment are summative anymore. We now understand that they are highly interactive and it is impossible to separate one from the other. Ergo, heritability is based on a demonstrably false assumption. Now, limb three is here. Heritability is a group variance statistic. This means it says nothing about the individual and it says nothing about the actual thing we're trying to measure. So let's go back to height. If I've got a group of people with a bunch of different heights, I have a variance. There's variation between the tallest and smallest person. But if I look at one person, there is no variation. There's only one height. There is no heritability at the individual level. Regardless of how many statistics we get and numbers we get and studies we run, heritability will never say anything about you or any single person 
because that's just not what it's looking at. But equally important, because it's looking at variation, it says nothing about the actual trait. So let's say I have a group of people with all different heights, and the average of this group is 5 feet. And let's say the heritability of height at this moment is 80%. Wonderful. Now watch. Imagine if over the next 20 years, I feed this group of people a great diet, and give them access to health care and exercise, and they all start to grow. 20 years later, I return to them, I remeasure them, and now their average height is 6 feet tall. We just made these people grow. But look, because everyone changed at the same rate, we still have the same variance. The tallest person is still the tallest, the shortest is still the shortest, and we still have a bunch of people in between. This means even though height changed by one foot, heritability remains 80%. It tells us nothing about the manifestation of the actual trait we're interested in. So if you think heritability means we're all stuck in a certain box, nope, we can outgrow, outshine, outbuild any genes our parents gave us, but so long as we're collectively doing it as a group or a society, that will never show up in the heritability measure. Right. And the final limb is simply to look at actual values. Because heritability is a statistic about variation, I've always found that when you look at the actual values, it takes a lot of the sting out of this heritability game. So let's do that now. Let's play a little game. Schizophrenia is 80% heritable. So imagine I had a hundred pairs of identical twins, and we know one twin from each of these pairs has schizophrenia. Now I want you to take a guess. How many of the remaining twins do you think will suffer from schizophrenia? Well, seeing as schizophrenia is 80% heritable, most people guess 80 twins. If one twin has it, we'd expect 80% of the other twin to have it. In reality, though, the answer is 14. This makes it look like heritability should be 14%, right? Let's take a look at another one. Asthma. Asthma is 68% heritable. So same thing. If we had 100 pairs of twins and we know one of them has asthma, how many of the counter twin do you think has it as well? Most people would guess 68, but in truth the answer is 7. But let's flip it because it's equally absurd the other way. So hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are only 18% heritable. So if I have 100 identical twins and one has hemorrhoids, how many of the counter pair do you think would have it? Turns out the answer is 73. What about measles? Measles are only 16% heritable. Yet if I have 100 identical twins with it, 95 of their counter twin will also get it. So why isn't it 95% heritable? This is what happens when you look at variation and not actual statistics. Now I'm going to leave you with one more because this is my all-time favorite. Blood type. If I have 100 pairs of identical twins and one of them has a blood type, guarantee all 100 of the counter twin will have the exact same blood type. It's because it's a genetic construct put in place so early during the development process that environment can't really do much with it. Despite this, the heritability of blood type is only 68%. This is a measure that we know is completely genetic, yet somehow our twin estimates suggest that 32% of the variability comes from the environment we were raised in. It makes no sense. All right, we call it a draw. So the next time you hear a heritability argument, just remember all these ideas and feel free to push back. Say, wait a second, what are you actually talking about? And are you trying to make an ideological point or a scientific point? Because if it's the latter, there is far better data and thinking you can tap into than the twin heritability estimates. Now this does leave us with one final question. What about twins separated at birth? Yes, comparing identical to non-identical twins gives us some sort of estimate. But what happens if we separate identical twins at birth? Can this give us a better estimate, a better idea of what role genes play in development? Well, that's what we'll take a look at in our final episode. So I hope you're all well. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you at the next video. Bye, y'all.